Before we get started, please remember to like or subscribe to this video or podcast. It really helps others to find Cleaning Up. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Liebreich Foundation and Giladini Foundation. Hello, my name is Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. We've got a very special episode today because we have two participants and it's going to be a new format, a debate. Ben Goldsmith is a financier, an environmentalist, a philanthropist. He also has a farm in Somerset, which he is in the process of rewilding. Gareth Wynne-Jones is a Welsh sheep farmer. He has a sheep farm which has been in his family for 370 years, and he has, at this point, no intention whatsoever of rewilding it. Let's welcome Ben and Gareth to Cleaning Up. So Ben, Gareth, welcome to Cleaning Up, and cheers. Yechida. Cheers. There we go. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, what we'll do is, it, now, this is a slightly different format. We're not used to this on Cleaning Up. It's going to be a, a debate format um, because whilst both of you are great friends and very committed to um, the to biodiversity, to the landscapes, to nature, you have very different views of how to go about uh, achieving that. Um, so I've not, I've, I've no idea how this might, it might end up with everybody agreeing furiously, but it might agree, it might end up with uh, some disagreements, let's put it that way. Um, so if it's okay, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start, um, Ben, with you um, describing in a sense, because you, you've got, um, you're a uh, philanthropist, you're an environmentalist, you're a businessman, but you've also got a farm, do you not? And, uh, uh, and you're actually doing some quite interesting things on your farm down in Somerset. Can you talk, uh, talk us through what you're doing there? Yeah, sure. I have a farm. I wouldn't claim to be a farmer. I've, uh, I've like so many people, fantasized all my life about being a farmer, about spending time out in nature, and um, but I certainly wouldn't describe myself as a farmer, although I gave it a pretty good shot. I, um, I, I bought a farm in my mid 20s in Somerset um, at the time, 150 acres. It's a little bit bigger than that now. And it was um, at the time that I bought it, there was a herd of, uh, of, uh, of um, longhorn cattle there, white box. Um, and I decided to make a go of that. So I the farm manager who was there was retiring and. He helped me find a successor and he was the real farmer in the show. And what we attempted was kind of nature friendly farming with the idea that perhaps we might make it profitable. And I found um, I found a restaurant in East London that I'm yet to visit. But I found a restaurant in East London that is a butcher by the day and a restaurant at night. And um, they do this tail, uh, nose to tail thing. So they buy a whole carcass and they serve up um, different cuts to uh, the punters during the day and then they roll out a big table at night and, and, and do a big kind of carvery restaurant in the evening. So I was supplying them sort of a carcass and a half on average a month uh, from my white parks. But white parks take nearly three years to mature and um, it just, you know, I'd be a little bit embarrassed to show you my accounts. It wasn't, it, well, let's say it wasn't, it wasn't the most profitable activity and even selling direct to a restaurant that recognised the quality of what we were producing. Now, we, we weren't registered organic. I couldn't really be bothered with the headache of all of that. But we were effectively organic and we were grass fed and we were doing all sorts of lovely nature friendly things. Nice, nice um, wildflower rich meadows managed in accordance with the guidance and lovely bushy hedges. And we built new ponds and we did lots of good stuff around the edges. Um, I'd say that the beef we were producing was structurally underpriced. So I got a glimpse for myself that the market does not necessarily put adequate value on really well-produced product. And this was um, how long ago? So we're talking 2007, eight when I started right the way through till about 2018, 19. Okay. Um, and then and, an epiphany or what happened then? So, um, um, so I decided that um, I would like to go whole hog on nature restoration on my my land just because it gives me great joy and I wasn't making a living let's say I wasn't dependent upon that farm to make a living so I have a luxury in being able to take that kind of a choice so I decided that what I would do is sell off my herd of white parks to um, uh, a, another white park farmer not far away and um, I also sold my 40 dogs pole sheep 
And all I kept were three Tamworth sows and a boar and um, a pony for the kids. And other than that, the animals are gone. And I removed all of the fencing that divides up our fields, um, which, which um, have only really been divided as fields for about 120 years. You know, the 1860s, 1870s maps of Selwood, which is the landscape that I'm in, um, didn't show fields. It was much more of a kind of open landscape of, of the kind that Gareth farms. Um, and then it was enclosed into fields more recently than most of Britain. And so I, I, I removed all of the fences. I, I filled in a lot of the ditches and created, I copied James Rebanks, unashamedly, uh, the author of English Pastoral, and re-wiggled a stream along the valley bottom and created a new wetland. And really have had a lot of fun kind of restoring habitat on, on, on that landscape and, and kind of letting, letting the land go to rack and ruin, as my friend and neighbor says, Mark Cottle, 62 year old dairy farmer, thinks it's hilarious what I'm doing. I've become quite a good friend. He says it's going to rack and ruin. And he's right. I've got hawthorn and blackthorn and dog rose poking through the fields. I've got bramble popping up everywhere. The hedges look in a right state. But there are a lot more birds, a lot more flowers. And the idea that I have with a neighbour next door, another neighbour who, who has about 180 acres, is to share a single herd of longhorns that we'll build up over time that will wander extensively in that landscape. And we'll sell a bit of beef and perhaps we'll find our way into a nice environmental land management scheme and get some grants for for the nature recovery there and um and um perhaps we might put up the odd tree house or do some camping or something to get some visitors in um or even a little farm shop selling the best of local produce so whether we can make a business out of it i don't know um as i said i'm in the luxurious position of not needing to create a living for myself from that land um and i'm finding it very rewarding on other levels um bringing nature back I, I would just finish by saying the land that I'm on is grade five agricultural land. It's really difficult to make it work for anyone doing anything. It's thick, wet clay. You, you literally can't, you can barely get onto the fields in a pair of Wellington boots for eight months of the year. So the fact that it's so wet, it's so heavy, um, I, I think almost any kind of food production is going to be a struggle on that land, except okay. for the most extensive, most kind of lightweight form that, 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 that we're going to try. Okay, Ben, so you've started with all the caveats, right? The land is rubbish and, and you've admitted that it wasn't uh, making money before and, and that, you'd, you know, that, you'd, that it's been fun. You used the word fun and so on. So we, we get it. And that's not a criticism. It, um, uh, it, it's just that I'm just sort of echoing back some of the things that you've said. But you go beyond that in your sort of vision for the natural landscape of the UK and, and, and other places um, that, you know, to, to suggest that much more of it should be rewilded and that there we've got some uh, you know, historic problems with land use that we really need to remediate and we need to go much more in that direction of rewilding, even though you've admitted that it doesn't really work economically probably on, on your land. So, so firstly, we don't know that it doesn't work economically because we don't know what the shape of future support system is going to be for farmers and landowners who are doing this kind of stuff. No doubt there is an economic value to society in that we are directly going to help reduce flooding in Froome, which is a town downstream. Every single year that town floods. And if we in the upper part of the catchment can hold a little bit more water in our land after rainfall, we will help reduce flooding. We'll also help regulate the flow and, and, and help reduce water shortages in the summer as well. So there's an economic value to what we're doing, whether that's recognised or not in a future support system, we will see whether I can make my tree houses or camping work, who knows, um, it's, it's an unknown quantity. Um, what, I, what I would say though, is that um, I think farming is integral to the process of nature restoration. I've never said that farming should be excluded. I think that we need to incentivize certain changes in the way that some of the land is farmed in order to, um, in order to encourage the restoration of nature. But I do, I've never recommended removing okay. land, farmers from the land. I think that's, that, that, that's anathema to nature recovery. I think if you don't have profitable, thriving farmers on the land, you won't have nature recovery. And I'm, I'm more than happy to explain from an ecological perspective why I think that's the case. Okay, I was I was fishing for you to come up with some of your the more um, florid statements that you've made on on Twitter about deserts and uh, and about yeah. sheep farming and the, 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 and and so on. Um, uh, but you know, I, I'm not sure if you want to go into that or if I should. Uh, uh... Well, I, I I mean, I so so the reason from an ecological perspective, forget the 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 the, 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 the e equally important aspect that that farming is the cultural backbone of our country, the fact that we've been intensively farmed 
almost throughout our island for certainly two millennia. Um, you know, the fact that most rural communities are underpinned by the economic activities of farming. You know, forget all of that and let's just purely talk about the ecology of it. One of the keystone species in our environment is the cattle. You know, it, native cattle and, and, and before we were active farming the land, you wild ox and bison. And if you just abandon the land, you end up with like those children's, children's fairy tale books, the scary bit of land, which is a dense woodland, which is kind of monotonous in an ecological perspective, impenetrable and, 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 and not particularly valuable to anyone. And so I, I think that the presence of grazing livestock in the landscape is absolutely essential if we're going to have any type of nature recovery. And so therefore, farmers and their livestock, I think, are the, are the um, I think they're the key to bringing back a bit of life to some of these landscapes that have been terribly depleted. And, and just to talk about deserts, I, I, I really think you know, most of our country is terribly naturally depleted, you know, most of it. You know, we, we're, we're in the bottom 10 or 15% of all the countries on earth. And, and that's for a whole bunch of reasons. You can't go and blame one segment of society. You know, the whole of society has demanded cheaper food. The European Union has subsidized particular forms of agriculture and has created disincentives to leave any rough corners or any little wetland patches or anything as ineligible features under the common agricultural policy. And so the whole of society carries the burden of this. And I think that turning it round has to be led from the front by the farmers who are on the land and, and their livestock are the key to it. Right. And what do you say when you see something like, you know, the Lake District, you know, these kind of barren uh, mountains that some people find very beautiful? Um, what do you think when you see those? Well, I've been quite honest about it. I mean, I, I find them quite distressing. You know, if you saw those landscapes in Morocco or, or in some kind of developing world country, you know, we'd be rushing to provide them with some development assistance to help figure out how to tackle the overgrazing and restore the ecosystem. And I think that, you know, I think they're terribly overgrazed. And, and I think that that's a function of subsidies that have driven very high numbers of sheep. Admittedly, they've declined a bit since the 90s, the peaks in the early 90s, but still, I think there's far too many grazing livestock there because the incentives are all wrong. And I think if society would like to see the re-emergence of some trees, some scrub, a few more wildflowers, a little bit more complexity, a bit more diversity in that landscape, then they need to provide farmers in that landscape with the incentive to do that. And for the most part, this is going to be heresy, I'm scared to look at Gareth when I say it, but for the most part, I think that means perhaps fewer sheep and perhaps more cattle and horses. You know, and I, 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 but I think that farmers should should be rewarded or incentivized to do that because why should they otherwise? Right. OK, that's a fantastic point at which to bring in Gareth. Gareth's been listening. He's had the advantage of listening to you first. Um, I'm a bit scared yeah, of Gareth. <laughs> Gareth, do you want to start? Just like, just... I'm joking. <laughs> Gareth, do you want to start by... Um, describing a little bit about how you how you farm. What is it you're exactly doing up there in uh, in in Wales? How do you farm? How many head of sheep? Uh, and and um, and then we can get on to some of those questions about about whether it's overly intensive and whether you've created a desert and and, and so on. And I'm I'm putting words into into Ben's mouth that he hasn't used today, but he has <laughs> used on Twitter. No, not no. created. Maybe maintained, but not created. Uh, okay, I'm, so you've made so there you go, Gareth. That's that's the red flag. Uh, for you know, you've no, I've, I've, enjoyed, your, I've but, enjoyed listening to him, Michael. I've enjoyed listening to him, you know, because I think if we don't open the conversation and have a debate about it, you know, what's the whole point? I think it's facts we need, and I think the word is balance, you know, it's getting that balance right. And I blame again a lot of government policies. Um, you know, supermarkets pushing prices down and cheap food comes at a cost to something. So it'll come at a cost to the farmer, the land, our environment, our um, sustainability to make sure there's a future for our children here. Yeah? So these are the things that we need to address. Now, going back to me, my farm, my family and my love and... Um, 370 years my family has farmed this land. My great, 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 great grandmother would have sat in this house and her name was Alice Cadwallader. And that is the history that we have going forward. One of the things I learned from a, my father as a very, very young man was 
When we leave this land, we leave it in a better state than we've had it. And that is the ethos of my family. My farm is farmed on the foothills of the Karanevai Mountains, which is 27,000 acres of open land. We have grazing rights there. Her Majesty the Queen owns a big part of it, and the National Trust owns another big part of it. But we have the grazing rights. We have the grazing rights for ponies, and we have the grazing rights for sheep there. And this is where I'm going to, you know, beg to differ with Ben on this, that, you know, sheep are a problem. Everything's a problem if you've got too many and you don't know how to manage them, okay? The sheep's biggest enemy is another sheep. And this is what management is all about. And we've got a word in Wales that's called knebbing. You would call it hefting in English. And knebbing means belonging to a certain area. I was a young boy, I would travel with my father, him on a big cob and me on a little Welsh mountain pony, a Carnedo one that I broke myself. And we would take the sheep up into different areas, different areas of the mountain. And that mountain is full of different habitats. It's a mosaic of, you've got your, we call the Greek, which is the heather. We have then, you know, the, the bigger areas at the top where we have the grasses, where these grow. We have the blanket bogs, we have the wetlands. These are all the places that we were taught as children to take our animals. So we run about 4,000 ewes in the family. Now that sounds a lot, Ben, but there was four brothers in the business and my father was one of them. And each one of them brought a son into the business. So at one point there was eight of us living off them sheep. And unfortunately, um, two of them are passed. So there's only six of us. My father's still here. Um, thank gosh, telling me what to do every day, which is lovely. Not, not many people can say they've spent all their working life every single day with their father. You know, um, I followed in his footsteps. I am immensely. He's like the biggest hero I've ever had. And um, he's still driven. And he's at 84 years old. He still loves going up to that mountain and seeing, you know, the new foals being on the Caranera ponies or uh, lambing now, it's a busy time. So all the new life is coming in. And this is where I'd like to invite Ben. Michael's been up, he's seen what we do up here. And this is where sometimes things I never heard of. In 2006, we went out and we sourced money from Europe and we set up a grazing agreement, a, a PLC, it's Aber, Aber Gwyn Gregin and Llanfar Vechan Grazius. My first language is Welsh, you can tell. And it's a PLC. There's 22 farmers in it. And I was um, one of the former directors. I've been a chairman and I'm a vice chair now. And, and we, we work together with these 22 farmers. And this was the best thing we did because as a group, we had rights for 15,000 sheep on that mountain. So we worked with government to source money to take a little bit of them sheep off the mountain, okay? And so they gave us X amount of money to keep the mountain clean in the winter. So our sheep will only graze from the 1st of April till the 26th of October. After that, there's no sheep on the mountain. This is an intricate part of sustainable food production. This is a way that they used to do it. In Welsh, it's called Havod a Hendre. There's a Havod and the Hendre. It's the hefting. And using that summer grazing, using the natural growth to produce our lamb, our beef. And it's the same with the cattle. Our cattle are in the sheds over winter to protect the, the ground. And then once the spring, the calves are coming now, once the spring comes, we take them onto the area we call the Frithov. Now the Frithov are the intermediate land, the land in between the open mountain and our lower land where we lift the silage so we can have that stuff to feed over the winter to the cows. So if you can see where we're going with all these jigsaws, 
And this is where I really believe the answer is because when you come up and you see our mountain, and I hear these words, Michael said that it, the deserts, you want to hear that dawn chorus up on the Carnera when that sun coming up, I'll tell you. I've been, I've been there since a little boy and it still absolutely fills my heart with joy. But for me, every time I see a dead pony, I see new life. That animal has died up there and will be feeding so many different families. And that's the circle of life. And again, the sheep, when a sheep dies up there over the summer, that carcass lasts no time at all. They're in there. It's a symbiotic relationship. The farmer, the livestock, and of course, the mountain itself. And farming it properly is really, really important that we don't overgraze and we don't undergraze. It's getting that balance. Okay. Now, that's been a, a fantastic description. I hope that the, um, the listeners, the audience can imagine, and I have visited, it is the most magical place because it's a, it's a, it, it was a nice day when I was up there, but you could see that much of the year, it's a pretty brutal place, brutal for the animals, brutal for the farmers, difficult, not easy farming. Uh, this is not, you know, the Midwest of the US. This is, this is tough farming. Um, but it's also a place without many trees, in fact, I think I, we came across one tree when we were driving around, Gareth, you remember, I actually uh, actually used what three words to put a, a, a pin on it so I could find it again if I ever come up. Uh, and it was a windblown tree and so on. And, you know, 4,000 ewes, you have to assume that before it was farmed for sheep, it would have had a different ecosystem, right? In, in nature, uh, it would have had a different ecosystem, would it not? Yeah, of course it would. But it's the same as what London would be. And you're sitting most probably on, on a swamp marsh. And it's it's pretty different down there to what, what we've got. You know, man has developed. Man has had to feed himself. We've got millions of people in this country. And we, as the Celts, were pushed up by some people over the border, up into this marginal land to make a living. Behind my house is a Celtic um, hill fort. It's amazing. The roundhouses are there. You've seen it, Michael. You know, the people up there have made terraced fields up there to produce food. So we've been doing this. You know, you, when you say the habitat's changed, if you come along the A55, there's a belt. There's 200 acres just in front of my house of ancient woodland now still standing there. You know, it's a beautiful area. There's a belt all the way along the 55 that takes us nearly around the Carnevai, and, it, and it's a belt of ancient woodland, which has been left. So again, I address that word, that balance, and that's what we have to do. We okay, have so, to get things right. Right, so, so Ben, uh, that's a, a call for balance, which basically means we've got a belt of ancient woodland, leave us alone, we're doing this, we've been doing it for hundreds of years, and it's not a desert, because there's lots of biodiversity, but it's it, this is the way to do it. And, you know, aren't you going to find that with every piece of land that you say, well, you know, whether it's the Lake District or whether it's the Grouse Moors or whether it doesn't matter what it is, you're always going to find somebody who says, oh, but it's traditional for this to look exactly as it does. So rewilding, whatever you want to do, fine, but not here. I guess. By the way, I'd like to visit. I mean, Gareth, you paint an amazing picture and I, I don't know Wales at all. I have a cousin who lives in the Welsh borders, but I, I don't know Wales and I, I, I would really love to visit you one day. That would be a, a great pleasure. Um, I, I know that in England, up the western part of England, from Cornwall all the way up to the Lake District, there was more of a wood pasture environment, even as recently as the beginning of Queen Victoria's reign, or certainly 1800, you know, the early, early 1800s you still had extensive wood pasture. And in places like the Cotswolds, um, the farming tradition was to turn out your cattle, more cattle than sheep. There were sheep. There were probably somewhere between eight and 12 million sheep in Great Britain at, at the time of the 1800, early 1800s. Um, so a few sheep, some cattle, some pigs, they would turn them out, common grazing, and then they would bring them back in and so on. And, and the intensity of grazing increased during the reign of Queen Victoria to the extent that young trees were not able to take over as the older ones died. So it wasn't as if someone showed up with a chainsaw and cut all the trees down. 
it was more that there wasn't recruitment and you ended up with these geriatric wood pastures and ultimately there were no trees remaining. Exactly the same has happened in the Highlands of Scotland. The actual deforestation for the most part happened a long, long time ago. What really happened was that for about a hundred years, there were a lot of sheep um, belonging to the big landowners and then subsequently a lot of red deer. You know, when, when, when Prince Albert decided to wear a Sherlock Holmes hat and Queen Victoria decided to buy Balmoral and they said that the cool, the, the, the fashionable thing you can do is go deer stalking and suddenly every English and Scottish laird turned his estate into a Sherlock Holmes deer stalking unit. Um, then suddenly 20 times more deer than there'd ever been before and you ended up with geriatric forests because no new trees were able to grow and then eventually no forests at all. And so I, I guess um, it, it, in, 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 in the world in which I, I um, kind of have my imagination, you know, perhaps one could incentivize farmers that are operating in these remote landscapes, you know, in partnership with the taxpayer to reestablish some woodland cover. You know, we don't want, no one wants dense woodland. No one wants wholesale rapid landscape change. I think that what environmentalists would like is to see a dappling of trees and scrub appearing on what are fundamentally semi-open landscapes. And, and amidst those trees and that scrub, you would still have the traditional hefted sheep and you would still have uh, the, the native cattle. And, and certainly um, the, those native horses are something that I would love to see. And they all play their own part in the ecology and they all play their own part in the economy of the region. Now, I think that, um, so, so the, the, the way I see it is that if you could get the market to recognize the value of food produced in this way, you know, someone like Gareth should be selling their meat at a premium because it's the highest quality meat you can buy. That's what you wanna be cooking for your family, not some junk produced in a factory yard where the animals are stuffed with grain or whatever. So if, if the food is produced in that way, there should be some sort of recognition for that on, on the part of the market. And that's partly about curtailing the, the cartel buying power of the supermarkets. It's partly about making sure that there are proper standards applied to imports that match the standards that we apply to producers here in the UK. Um, and, and also I think that you know, if, if society wishes to see the reemergence of, of these wood pasture landscapes, there should be some incentive, some payment for that, because there will be economic as, as well as other societal benefits. There'll be less flooding potentially, there'll be carbon sequestration, there'll be biodiversity, there'll be all sorts of things. And therefore, I, what I feel like is the way forward is for the taxpayer to provide a fair and generous incentive to farmers operating in these landscapes to figure out how they can reestablish wood pasture. And, and then leave it to those land managers who've been there for generations to figure out how to do that. You know, if Gareth was asked, I presume, Gareth, how do you how do you restore some scrub, a smattering of scrub, a smattering of trees across that landscape that you're farming? I'd be pretty sure that you'd have the answer to that. And it certainly wouldn't involve the removal of all your animals and all your, you know, um, uh, 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 companieros in farming. That wouldn't be what, you know. So, so um, I, I guess that's the big question. Well, is, let, 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 let's ask Gareth. I mean, is that is that a feasible thing? Well, when Ben comes up, I will take him to an area of land, okay, that we fenced off 25 years ago. It's not a big area. It's about a quarter of an acre. And it is a ticking time bomb. We've been lucky so far. It hasn't gone on fire. Um, I've kept it and I've taken quite a few people, environmentalists, people um, that have been involved in policy making um, to have a look at it. And this is where I go back to that balance again. You know, we can have these areas, but we need to graze them properly. You know, we, we can plant these trees in certain areas if it's grazed properly. And I'm not against planting any trees. We're working now with a national lottery heritage fund. We've won 2.4 million onto the Cabernetai Mountains. Uh, I was the chairman. We worked very hard to get this lottery funded. And we're going to be planting trees on the mountain um, in certain areas. And, and, you know, have I got a problem with that? Definitely not. But what I've got a problem with is the policy makers, the people in Whitehall and down in our Welsh Assembly, they're not, are not listening to the people that are on the coalface, the people that are working the land, that know these lands, are all different. However you look at it, you said about your land, Ben, how heavy it was, how hard it was to manage. You know, there's different scenarios on every farm. So when they put in a big scheme, a blanket scheme across Wales, across England, and say, right, 
plant X amount of trees, do this, do that. It doesn't work. I agree with you. I agree with you. But that, that's, why, that's why I think outcomes focus is the way to do it. So if they come to a group of landowners or a group of farmers in a particular river catchment and say, can you amongst yourselves please figure out how to slow the flow of water down into this town each winter? And then those land, landowners, those farmers can get together and say, well, look, if we, if we re-wiggle the streams along our valley bottoms, if we give the rivers 20, 30 yards fenced off with buffer, or if, if, if we allow a bit of scrub and trees to grow up the side of these steeper parts of the valleys, we will help achieve that objective. It's up to the landowners, the farmers, to figure out how to deliver the outcome. The taxpayer simply specifies what outcome they want. Is that the answer? Yeah, I think it's part of the answer. Um, but I think we have to look at the whole problem sometimes as well. Uh, the Migan Ants, which is um, just up the road from us, and there was massive problems down in Clarus. So they decided to, again, close the ditches. They carried some bracken from here, baled it, and put it in the ditches to slow it down. But the flooding's still happening, you know. There's trees being planted on that. So I think we have got a major climate issue. And I think we've all got a role to play in this. And the only way to do that is to get the people in power to listen. They have to listen. They have to come out. You know, this agreement we did in 2006 has really worked. You know, I, I could sit down and give people you know, a, a blueprint. It wouldn't have to be exactly, but a blueprint of how we did it. You know, we've got a constitution. We've got, you know, we've got this group that comes together to source money, to help environmentally based, to sell our produce. All these things, you know, are not just adding value to what we're producing, but it's adding value to the environment, to society. You know, the whole big picture of people coming from London or Manchester to see the ponies, up on this mountain is part of the journey, yeah. you know? And I want people to come here and see the sheep grazing environmentally friendly ways and show them what we've got on the mountain from the Montane Heath, which is very, very rare. And this is the most southerly part it's here. Now, it hasn't just appeared because the NRW fenced it off or it. It's been here because this land has been managed properly. And don't get me wrong, Ben, it ha we have had problems. You know, the 1970s and 80s, when they were paying people to keep sheep per head, people were keeping a lot more sheep because they knew that's what they were getting paid for. So it was a lot to do with not just the farmer, but the basement of what government was putting out as policies coming from Europe and, and you know, um, Parliament. So these are the things that need to come together. We need to work with environmentalists, you know, and, and don't take this the wrong way, wrong way, but I hate that word rewilding. It absolutely boils my blood, I'm sorry, but it does because what about what what about what about the idea of rewilding in a place where you don't necessarily have a rich or historical farming tradition? Let's say you're buying up a Let's say you're, you're proposing to rewild land in a remote valley that's been mined in India or Canada or Morocco, you know, where, where you're not necessarily displacing one activity in exchange for another. You're simply restoring a landscape that has been degraded in the past. In those places, surely rewilding is not a bad thing or rewilding in the sea where you where you create. You don't have a problem yeah. with that. No, but let's let's rewind. Let's rewind and let's go down to mid Wales just behind me down here. Right. I agree okay. with you. I agree with you. A lot, a lot of money coming out. And I'll just give you one example why this boils my blood, Ben, because they come in, there was a lot of money behind it. There were some big names. You know, George Mumbai is a friend of mine. We we argue like cat and dog, but, you know, I, I see some things that I agree with him and some things I don't. But when you come into an area like that, a lot of money, a lot of ideas. Yeah, and they start talking to farmers. But they just bulldozed everybody. They didn't really listen to the people that were there. And they made so many enemies so quickly. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Now, I get a phone call, okay? I get a phone call and a really good friend of mine from the area says, have you seen this? And it was a BBC announcement. Rewilding project that brought some conic ponies, the amazing ancient ponies into greys, into Wales. I was going ballistic. We've got 220 
breeding mares left in the world. The Carnedai ponies go back to the Celtic times. They ran up here semi-feral for thousands of years. They didn't even Google us. They didn't even phone us. They didn't even ask us. These ponies were more relevant than anything that they could have done. They could have made the story to build around that, that they were using. And you know the word, that native breed, you know? And when we do that, and when we take that native and do the whole rewilding and we talk about what we do and then just really brush everything under the table and then there's some excuse that somebody knew somewhere in somewhere that these ponies are great to graze this area. Well, come on. We, yeah. we have to really look at ourselves then, I think. Okay, now, so, wait, uh, hang on, Ben, because I'm having trouble getting a word into, in Edgewise. This is my programme, my show, uh, so I'm allowed in just every so often. You've been doing a great job, actually. These are exactly the issues that I wanted to talk about. But I do want to um, I do want to say, because what you've agreed on is that sort of heavy-handed intervention from central government or from anybody from outside telling you what to do is not the answer but there is there is still a conflict because um if you go to the sort of the, the, behind the idea of rewilding there's this idea that kind of nature knows best right and if you look at uh net house uh then the idea would be you know this is the the, the um um, I suspect Ben was quite an inspiration when you looked at your own farm um, that you just kind of, uh, you know, remove the fences and let, you know, let, let nature do what it wants and you'll get the birds and the butterflies and so on. But that's very different from what Gareth is describing, which is a very active management by the people with a stake in the local area. And one area this might sort of come to a head is around things like uh, reintroduction of beavers, introduction of predators, um, where you know, the, the rewilding thesis would be, well, of course, you've got to do that and then let them find their natural roles. But yeah. you, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that you would agree, or both the two of you would, might not agree on that. So let me answer that. So, so I think a term which is more appropriate in the vast majority of Great Britain is wilder farming. Robin Page uses it. Um, you know, I, I tend to use it. And, and that really is nature restoration engineered by farmers and their livestock, which I think is pretty similar in outcome to what we might describe as rewilding. So the, the right number of livestock in the right places, I think will engineer you that nice mosaic of habitat that ultimately we all love. So, so how to deliver more scrub, more trees, more wildflowers and so on, I think ultimately is down to the, the manager of that land. Only Gareth really knows how best to achieve more trees on his land. But but certainly the cattle and the sheep and the and the and the horses will play a big part in, in, in making sure you don't end up with a um a, an incendiary bomb, as, as as Gareth put it. You know, and, and so I think that um the reason why I think that wilder farming is a silver bullet is because it empowers the farmers to deliver the outcomes that many people in society want, which is slightly rough around the edges, smattering of trees and scrub, a landscape that looks a little bit wilder than the one in which we live today. And, I, I, and, and as soon as you get a bit of scrub and a few more trees, you increase exponentially the butterflies, the birds and so on. Not everywhere, not on a peat bog, but in some of those landscapes, some of those mountain sites. With, pred with predators or without predators? So in terms of rewilding, in terms of rewilding species and restoring missing species. So w w this is how I feel about it. Um, I feel for starters that we have a moral duty to put things back which we have made extinct, especially if we as a nation are ordering and cajoling and financing countries around the world to do the same. So here we are telling Sri Lanka to live alongside 6,000 elephants, you know, but we can't live with beavers. Or here we are telling the, 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 the Nepalese that they've got to make an effort to rebuild their population of tigers, which occasionally eat people, but we can't have links. So I think firstly, there is a kind of, there's a hypocrisy in that position. And secondly, there is a moral duty, I think, to put back that which we've destroyed. Having said that, there is a scale of awkwardness. You know, everything is a nuisance on some level. Foxes are a nuisance. They eat my chickens. You know, otters are a nuisance. They eat my fish. You know, I've got rudd. I like to catch my fish. Too many otters, I won't have any fish left. Cormorants, for the same reason, are a nuisance. Even moles, which is probably the most inoffensive creature known to man, they're a nuisance. If you gallop over a molehill and the horse's foot goes down, then you've got a problem. 
They're a nu- badgers are a nuisance. They spread TB, arguably. Um, uh, the deer are a nuisance in too many numbers. Um, they overgraze and you know, cause us a problem. Wild boar, my goodness, they're back now on the Welsh borders. They've spread down. They're in Dorset. They're in Devon. There are a lot of them around London, Sussex, Kent. They're, they're a big nuisance. They'll plough up your football fields. They'll eat your potatoes. They'll muscle their way under fences. Everything is a nuisance. You know, a lynx, it's a nuisance, especially if you're grazing sheep amongst trees, then they will take the odd sheep. And my goodness, you know, the top of the pile is the is the wolf. You know, a wolf is going to be a big nuisance for people. And, and I guess my position, and it is easy for me to say it because I don't make my living on the land, but my position is that we should try to find a way to coexist where we can. And that I think that the full generosity of the state should be used to help farmers and landowners and other people who are inconvenienced to do that so to take beavers before we talk about more difficult ones the, the real issue with beavers is when they start damaging the engineering works in our landscape you know at one end if they get into a sewage works or a fish hatchery that's a nightmare it's even worse if you've got um, a field of, 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 of high quality carrots on an engineered landscape and they breach the levees or they they they, you know, they they cause you a problem by raising the water table and flooding your carrots in those places, the taxpayer should pay for the cost of fixing that, of taking those beavers out, trapping them, killing them, whatever it is. And, and generally, the taxpayer should be responsible for helping those who live in the land to mitigate the issues that arise in certain places when beavers, when beavers come along. And I think the same is true of, um, of the more problematic species. I think that there's a, you know, that, 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 that coexistence has been shown that it can be done and where it requires support, then, then it should be provided. I'm not arguing that there should be wolves in central Wales or in Somerset, but I think in the highlands of Scotland, you know, why not? There's miles and miles and miles of landscape where all you've really got is red deer in, 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 hu- in huge numbers. You know, the whole economy up there is geared towards tourism and, and those sorts of things. You know, why shouldn't we expect to have wolves back if they've got them in Luxembourg and Holland and Normandy? You know, what, what, why would it be so crazy to put them in the most remote landscapes in Britain in the north? And as for the lynx, well, you know, the, the, the evidence suggests that in places where sheep aren't grazing amongst trees, they don't take sheep. And where they are, they take them in very, very low numbers. So in Norway, that has somewhere between three and six thousand lynx, the number of sheep killed is absolutely dwarfed in comparison with the number of sheep taken by foxes, by eagles, by crows pecking their eyes out, by exposure on the mountainside, by unpredictable weather, by disease, by worms. Lots of things take sheep on the mountainside. The lynx doesn't really feature. So I I don't really buy the argument that lynx is going to be as problematic as people say it is. But that being said, there needs to be a proper system for supporting landowners to coexist with that species. Um, And I think things like you know, I think like the, the argument around beavers, I'm completely lost upon. You know, you could have 100 beavers on Gareth's farm. I don't think you'd even notice them. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> Gareth, have you got any beavers? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. So be- beavers, yes or no? No, no. Well, well, I'd be interested to know why not. Just Can we talk about beavers just for a moment? Yeah, look, no, I haven't got a problem with beavers. I think if people are reintroducing them, let's reintroduce them in places where we can look at that scientifically. That's that's where I'm going. So, you know, let's fence them in. Let's see what they bring to, to the economy, to the environment, to the area, and, and let's manage that properly. And if it's working, yeah, I haven't got a problem. If they show me the stats to say, look at this, look at that, these beavers have made a difference in this area, I wouldn't be... I wouldn't have any problem with seeing them on our river. But I'll go back again now to, to, this, to this question, and which really gets me going again, the rewilding and the word balance, OK? So I think government have got a massive, massive problem here because we look at what we've got out of balance, and, and that is the badger. And I love badgers. We've got badgers here. But as a boy, I'd never seen one. OK, and in this area now, there's a lot of them. Thank God we haven't got TB. We're very, very lucky. There's a few people that have had it um, a bit further down the road. But the problem lies that government brought a policy up to protect these animals. And they are lovely. But if we don't keep that balance, we will lose so much. And I will tell you, as a boy, there would be hedgehogs everywhere here. 
They'd be ground nesting birds. The higher up you go, you can find them. But these badgers are killing every hedgehog. They are trashing our ground nesting birds. They're not, they haven't got a chance. It's it's an awesome creature. And, and this is where, you know, my belief is, it's not just about the TB. It's about addressing this. And this is where we have to have a balance. But, and we yeah, have to look I, at... But can I... Yeah, but can I just finish, yeah. Michael? Because I, I, this is really, really important. Because if you look at the RSPB, okay, the RSPB nearly killed 600 foxes last year. They shot 800 crows. You tell me why. Yeah. Come on. You know, we've got... Nobody hears about it. Nobody's willing to talk about it. We've got to step up. We're at the top of this food chain. And if we don't control it and make sure, because that's that's why we're losing a lot of our hedgehogs. So I, so I haven't changed my farming policies. I haven't. I don't use pesticides. You know, I don't use insecticides. This land is virtually the same. Okay. It's, it's still farmed a little bit different, but virtually the same. And in my generation, in my lifetime, I've seen a device of that lovely little hedgehog and only because we've got badges. So I, I don't think we disagree. I mean, I don't have a problem with killing stuff, you know, and I, I, I don't I, I, I don't subscribe to the view that man is somehow separate from nature. You know, I think we're absolutely part of the fabric of the natural world and we have to play our role in that. You know, nothing gives me a greater sense of satisfaction than going out with my son watching him shoot a roebuck in season, bringing it back, gutting it together, having the liver over the fire with onions and garlic on a bit of toast, and then hanging the deer and eating every scrap of it during the next three, four days. The only thing we failed to do is, um, is to cure the hide properly yet. I, I, I totally, I, all my life I've killed stuff and I have no issue with that. And, and, and I think that we do have a role to play in maintaining balance. But I would argue that a more complete ecosystem is, is perhaps more likely to be closer to balance by itself than one which has been impoverished. So they don't talk about midges in the west of Scotland in the 1860s, 1880s, but now midges are such a big problem that you can barely go to the west of Scotland in, 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 in August. And I think that things like the explosion of midges in the west of Scotland or the explosion of jellyfish that have taken place in the Mediterranean in the last 10 years is because that we've removed the things which control them. So jellyfish are eaten by turtles and tuna. We've killed all the turtles and tuna, so there's jellyfish everywhere. And I think that in the case of badgers, they do have predators. You know, the lynx will eat badgers. The white-tailed eagle will eat foxes. They found, they found 100 fox um, uh, uh, pelts underneath the nests of white-tailed eagles in one season in the west of Scotland on Mull and so on. So I think if you, if you bring back, I, mean, I don't know if you know anything about the eagle owl, but in Europe, the eagle owl will kill um, raptors. The eagle owl derives almost two thirds, I read, of its diet, killing buzzards and kites and crows and magpies and those kinds of birds. So if we've got too many kind of middling sized raptors, it might be because we don't have the big raptors to eat them and scare them away. So all, all, all I say is that when you rebuild the jigsaw puzzle and you restore some degree of ecological health, I think our role as the as the as the imposer of balance perhaps becomes a little bit less significant than it than it might otherwise be but then again but, i don't have four thousand sheep and um you know and i recognize that you know there is no easy answer to that you know there is no easy what, what i was going to do what I was, I, what I was going to do when i when i was you know um gareth was in full flow and he sort of <laughs> he rebuffed me quite expertly um but what i was going to suggest to, to ask is you know is his plea uh, gareth is your plea for balance sort of balance on your terms you know it's sort of balance as long as there's four thousand sheep i suspect i don't know but i suspect that you're providing uh fertilizer because some you've got to put nutrients back into the into the land so you're doing some sort of fertilizing there you've got four thousand uh sheep so you want to get rid of the badgers which are out of balance but you don't want the beavers the beavers were there before you for all well, Gareth said he does. Gareth, no, Gareth it was a great he didn't see Gareth was to, to be fair, Gareth said, I'll have beavers if I can see that they're beneficial and not harmful, which yeah. I, but I would say can be can be presented to Gareth quite well. If you let me organize that, Gareth, I'll give you a webinar on that. Well then um, yeah, I'd I'd love to see it. You know, there's some good science I, I, on that. But yeah. but I, I think the question is this: I think if society wishes people like Gareth, who are making a living from the land 
to put up with lynx living in the in the in the woodland that exists around their farms then society should offer them some incentive that they can't refuse because why should those farmers put up with that extra headache when they've got 101 headaches already unless there is something in it for them so i've always said whenever i've been asked that if we're going to ask a particular landscape to accommodate the reintroduction of a species like lynx it should come with an environmental land management payment of some sort whereby the farmers say Mm, well, let's look at the, how much of a headache this is going to give me. Let's look at what the payment per acre is. I'm going to go with this. That, that, that I think the equation should be in, and, in, conjunction uh, with, in conjunction with training and support for coexistence, because there are ways to coexist with these problematic species, and also a government compensation scheme if it goes wrong. So, Gareth, does that compensation for, uh, for, for, for annoyances or intrusion or lost animals... Does that work? Because in preparation for this um, episode, we talked about wolves and the impact potentially of wolves on hefting. And Ben's been very careful not to talk about wolves. He's but that's because I think wolves are. I think I think wolves are very difficult in a heavily farmed landscape. Okay. I think. But, I think, think, but lynx would lynx Gareth in uh, would that would that affect the hefting of your uh, of your sheep or not? I don't know enough about lynx to be honest with you. You know, I, I wouldn't go into that debate. But uh, again, you know, the mountain itself is twenty-seven thousand acres, and there's a lot of farmers that live off that. Let's not forget as well, we're producing one of the best qualities of protein from a very poor landscape. You know, from a, from a poor landscape. I mean, but uh, uh, you know, there, there's not a lot else you could do with that, and to produce that top quality protein to feed people i think it's important and when we get that balance you're right let's let's say for argument's sake they bring the links in and in, in five or six years we find the, that the links aren't taking many sheep but they're eating the dead carcasses why not yeah. okay. That's not, but, but if we're finding you know that these animals are making a massive dent into our livelihoods and i can tell you honestly we've lost about 15 lambs already we've only just started on the mountain um use we've lost about 15 lambs already to the fox you know and yeah, my next one, so eight, six or seven and it's natural okay there's there's a few more died of natural causes yes i would i wouldn't say otherwise but i know a fox kill you know i know how they do it they're beautiful animals they're very very clever and again we're bringing in another bigger predator. Okay. I, but the thing about finish? the lynx, so I would just say about the lynx briefly. Firstly, they don't leave the trees. So they almost never get seen on open ground unless they're being pursued by something. And the second point about the lynx is that they predate foxes in big numbers. They also predate badgers. But I would not suggest that the lynx gets brought back to any landscape that doesn't want it. I think what you'd need to do is work with local land managers and say, can you be persuaded and can society offer you enough of an incentive that you're willing to give this a go in the form of a payment through the environmental land management scheme or some such? OK, so we've got two pieces of follow up here, which is Ben is going to try and persuade you, Gareth, that you want beavers. And he's going to persuade, try and persuade you that you actually want lynx because they will actually predate the foxes and reduce the lamb, the loss of lambs. Now, I want to finish. Um, but there's two, two other topics we've just got to touch on. One is. Um, the sort of uh, libertarian free traders who, uh, and, and the other is um, militant vegans. So there's something for everybody here. The libertarian free traders would say, Ben, you have betrayed the right. You call yourself conservative. You've talked about the taxpayer paying for this, the taxpayer paying for that, the taxpayer paying for the other. Uh, if, if Gareth can't make this thing work, he should go away. He should open a and b He should do something else. But he should not be farming if he cannot be competitive. Right? Yep. And then we'll give Gareth the militant vegans. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we should get my wife down here on the vegans. She's a cook, and she has a real problem with vegans because she's a brilliant cook with meat. And, uh, and she has a restaurant where they have a big open wood fire, and they cook the most delicious meat from up in Northumberland and Cumbria. And, okay. uh, and uh, the free, they occasionally get vegans. In. So, sorry. So in terms of um, your point about the free market, right? Um, so I believe in free markets and I believe in fair markets. And I don't think a market in which we tell our farmers that they can't use sow crates, but then we import uh, pork raised from sour crates from abroad. I don't believe that to be fair. 
So I believe in the setting the same standards on imports as we set on those that produce our food domestically. The second thing is, I don't think it's a genuinely fair market if you're causing damage to society that society has to cover the cost of. So for example, if I'm a big factory pig farmer in North Carolina and my factory pig unit is polluting the air around my farm, the slurry is polluting the water, I'm probably killing the fish stocks in the river and out in the Chesapeake Bay, and society is carrying all those costs. That's not a fair market. I believe that the polluter should pay. So if you're running an operation which is causing um, uh, cost to society, I think those costs should be internalized in your business. So I believe in regulation. I'm in favor of regulation that says that you can't spread slurry alongside the river and so on. Um, but the third thing is, I'm also in favor of applying a fair economic value on, on things which are public goods. So for example, if Gareth is gonna help reduce flooding by um, uh, pursuing certain land management actions on his farm, he should be paid by the taxpayer for doing that. Or if Gareth is gonna absorb carbon into his land by doing certain practices that change the way the land functions and more carbon is stored, he should be paid for that. And if society chooses that it wants the links back in a particular landscape, then it should pay a fair and market price to those landowners that are gonna to have to spend their time figuring out how to deliver that. So I believe that the new system that we've got in England, I don't know about Wales, but the new system, which they call public money for public good, I think is aligned with my belief in free markets and fair markets. Because what we're doing is applying an economic value to what these farmers do for society and paying them for it. And I'd much rather that than a system in which we provide subsidies blind. You know, I don't believe in blind subsidies for any industry. And I think a lot of farmers are doing stuff which is really valuable to society and they're not being rewarded for it. So, um, so I think that I think that the, the, the ideas I've presented on this webinar and this debate, I think, are in line with my belief in free and fair markets. OK, well, that was a resounding uh, pushback against the, uh, the libertarian headbangers. And Gareth has had a couple of minutes to prepare his final uh, repartee his, his parting sally against the militant vegans which make his life hell on twitter i know <laughs> well i was told ben was a, a vegan but i really understood that that's definitely not true now so yeah twitter and uh, social media can be misleading uh for me you know i haven't got a choice i haven't got a problem with anybody's personal choice if you're vegetarian vegan pescatarian whatever it is that's not a problem my problem lies with, with people misleading others with the propaganda. You know, we've, we've had a hard time um, as livestock farmers. We've been blamed for many, many things, which I think are incorrect. You know, the way that we're producing um, lamb and beef up here is top notch. You know, we have a lot of rain, which makes the grass grow and the animals eat it. Every single day I'll be targeted by a, by a vegan, you know, or, or, or usually they're ethical vegans. I don't know what the difference is, but um, they seem to be a little bit more nasty. Truthfully, you know, that's their choice. You know, that, that is something that they've decided to do. For me, I think the way forward is to be eating a seasonal, sustainable, local diet. This is the way I think we could go forward to build a better Britain on our bellies. You know, I think a lot of the food that's processed now, we've got the OTs and we've got the corn and all this processed food that comes out. It's full of chemicals. It's full of all kinds of, I don't know. Um, and it's not for me. You know, I'd much rather go to the field, shoot a couple of rabbits, get some carrots, stick it in the oven, make a nice stew. That, that's my kind of healthy living. And I know, you know, your people that are living in inner cities, they, they, they most probably will never get that choice. But as well, they've lost that connection with food production. They've lost that connection with the land. And, you know, people try to shame others into, you know, you shouldn't be killing things. That's awful. Or while they're keeping cats and dogs and, you know, my, my brain can't, can't really take that in. You know, cats is the biggest killer that you'll ever get. And putting a cat on a vegan diet is going to kill it. You know, do dogs on vegan diets, it's definitely against what that poor animal's belief is and what it should be eating naturally. So for me, you know, I'd like to see more people having a balanced debate about it. 
because there's there's so much we can talk about going forward, making sure that our food's environmentally friendly, sustainable, seasonal, looking for these local ways we can grow more food, that we're not shipping it from Spain. We're not shipping the avocados from Mexico and making the Mexicans hungry because they can't afford, they can't afford their avocados anymore because we're shipping them all over here. And not, to, not to mention making the monarch butterfly extinct because they're clearing forests to grow more avocado. Thank you, Ben. We're agreeing on things and I can't believe it. <laughs> you know what? Um, have you come across the, the extreme end of the animal rights movement, which argues for the entrapment and, uh, and uh, um, um, placing into captivity of wild predators because of the cruelty that the wild predators inflict upon their prey? Whoa, no, that's even a new one for me. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Yeah. No more links. No more links in the wild anywhere. But a more link activity because of the cruelty to deer. No foxes or badgers or anything. That's no. the point. But life's cruel, isn't it? We all live and we all die, and that's that's the you know. And and people lose people. You know, we, we have to go out shoot fish, hunt to make our own feed our own families, and and I love that. And there's no better feeling for me to sit around my Sunday dinner knowing that everything on that plate feeding my family has been produced by my hands, you know, by me, for my family. It's a great feeling. And people have lost that. And people are on, on this bandwagon, this propaganda bandwagon that's built by massive industries like your corns and your oaties. You know, they've got an ad advertisement campaign now trying to shame dads not to drink the real milk. Real milk is one of the best wholesome foods we can ever have. And it's so well produced. And we should be making sure that children understand that. The school curriculum as well has got something to play in this. I think we need to be seeing more children on farms and giving them an educated choice on how they want to you know, live the rest of their lives. And, and this is really important. And I'm going to tell you, a story about a vegan that came to the farm okay his name was Tim Sheaf maybe you guys have heard of him he was the vegan prince he was the the winner of the free runner uh, on um, ninja challenge very very fit young man and he came up in 2015 and he spent the day with me and he just couldn't get his head around what we were doing up here we sat in the garden and I spoke about how we were planting our uh, veg and as he said to me he said this is the ideal way that I'd want to live and I said at night I'll sit on top of that wall waiting for Mr Rabbit to come in and I will shoot Mr Rabbit I said to him and he was like oh no man don't shoot the rabbit why don't you build bigger fences and walls to keep him out and I said there might be another 200 rabbits on my farm but that one rabbit that comes into my garden to eat my family's food is going to be shot and not only shot, but eaten by my family as well. So I, I was trying to show him, you know, what we did up here. So we, we finished the day, it was for BBC Countryfell. We finished the day on the top of the Cavanagh Mountains. Very romantic, sun setting over Anglesey, Michael, as you've seen it. Beautiful, beautiful. And I'm standing there with a vegan next to me. And Colin, who was producing it, said to me, have you got any more questions? And this was my question to Tim. I said, Tim, if you were born my son, do you think you would be standing next to me now as a vegan? And his words were me, to me, no man, no way, peace. And gave me the biggest thing. And I'm not going to lie, I had tears in my eyes because I knew he meant that. And we kept in contact. And we kept in contact for a long time. Four years down the line, I get a phone call off Tim. And I went, oh no. What's he want? And Tim goes, can I apologise, man? And I said, no, 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 don't apologise for anything. I need to apologise, he said, because I've seen, I've done, but now I'm coming back to eating meat. His health had left him. And, you know, this, this is the true thing. Everybody has a journey in life. Uh, however you think that journey takes you, however strong your beliefs are, that's your decision. And something might change that decision and it'll have to be personal but that propaganda bandwagon needs to be addressed because there's a lot of kids youngsters people that are getting sucked in 
And I really think that we need to change that ethos and we have to educate them on sustainable food production, environmentally healthy production, seasonal, local. That's my take on the militant vegan. Right, well, uh, on that note, you said that uh, life is cruel, nature is cruel to a certain extent. Uh, farming may even be cruel because it does involve, uh, it does involve the, the, the uh, raising of livestock and the, and the ending of their lives. However, the clock is also cruel and we've run out of time. So we're going to have to leave it there. But I have a feeling, I have a feeling that this will actually be only the first of many times that the three of us are going to get together. Thank you so, so much for joining me here today on Cleaning Up, both of you. Yeah, come on. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Gareth. So that was Ben Goldsmith and Gareth Wynne-Jones debating rewilding the future of farming and the British landscape and actually agreeing on a lot more than I thought they would. My guest next week is Naoko Ishii. She was for eight years the CEO and chair of the Global Environment Facility of the UN. She is now Executive Vice President and Director of the Center for the Global Commons at the University of Tokyo. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Naoko Ishii.